I'm here at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square with Charmeen Mosavar Romani. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Charmeen is the Chief Investment Officer of Goldman Sachs Investment Strategy Group. You guys came out with your 2018 outlook, and one of the things that stuck out, I'm sure, to a lot of people is that you don't think valuations are particularly too high. Do you think that they're really sustainable at the levels that they've been at? When we talk about valuations with our clients, we tell them they need to think about the context. What's the overall context in which we're looking at these valuations? When we look at an environments where inflation is low, and very importantly, the volatility of inflation is low, which is the environment we're in, the market has typically sustained much higher valuations. So if we look at a range of market valuation measures, whether it's Schiller Cape, whether it's price to book, whether it's price to trailing earnings, price to peak earnings, when we look at these measures, they look like they're in the what we would call the 10th decile, meaning generally valuations are cheaper 90% of the time. And when we look at the long-term average, it looks like they're 70 plus percent overvalued. However, when we look at valuations and compare them to periods of low and stable inflation, it only looks like it's about 20% overvalued. So the level of overvaluation is not as high as people are thinking. Then we take the economic backdrop and say, well, we have a favorable economic backdrop. The economy is growing. In fact, the US is likely to grow faster this year than, let's say, last year. Generally, global growth will be a bit better, let's say, at 3.5%. As the IMF has reported, we have better synchronization, meaning they're the largest number of countries who are growing now than we've ever seen. So you have a better global backdrop. You look at fiscal policy, you look at monetary policy, all favorable. And so in the context of the backdrop, the global environment, these valuations at 20% more expensive is not that significant. That alone is not going to mean we have to have a bear market. And so if you're in a period of low and stable inflation, the valuations don't look that overvalued. But what happens when inflation rises? So the key question for us is to monitor carefully several things, one of which would be inflation. But we're actually not concerned about inflation. And inflation has been a topic now for several years. Everybody's looking for inflation to be just around the corner, and it hasn't. Some of this, in our view, is driven by major structural forces, globalization creates many more opportunities for companies to reduce their costs. So as long as that continues and exists, and you look at companies trying to find the cheapest source of whether it's labor, whether it's manufacturing resources, then we think inflation is going to stay subdued and within the targets that the Fed is looking for. And it's not just inflation in the US, but inflation globally, whether we're looking at Europe or whether we're looking at, uh, let's say, Japan. So what could derail the market? <clears throat> Um, the title of our outlook is sort of steady and unsteady. We're trying to say that there are a lot of steady factors, such as the economy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, but there's a very strong unsteady undertow. Factors such as the geopolitics. What about all the geopolitical tensions with North Korea? What about risks of terrorism? What about risks of major cyber attacks? So when we look at some of these factors, we know that they can be a source of volatility, a big source of downdraft, but it's very hard to attribute a certain probability. We just can't predict these things. So our recommendation to our private wealth management clients is that they should stay invested in equities because we can't predict what will happen with North Korea. We speak to a broad range of experts on this topic, and they will have uh, the risk of a military engagement with North Korea, some as low as 10, some as high as 50%. So given that broad range, it's not as if one can say, let's underweight equities in anticipation of something that may or may not happen. And you still like US equities more than other global equities? Yes, we have had a, a general bias towards US equities, both tactically, so the thought of overweighting any particular country or region or sector, we have been biased in favor of US equities. And strategically, meaning long term, irrespective of the environment, we also recommend clients have an overweight to US equities. We, US preeminence has been an investment theme for us from 2009, where there were all these naysayers who said, oh, this is the end of the American century, this is the beginning of the China century. Our view has been that no, US is preeminent, 
across a broad range. Everything from as simple a factor as demographics to something like innovation to incredible corporate management. There have been lots of very interesting academic studies that show US corporations are the best managed. And within that group, multinationals are among the best managed. So if you have S&P 500 exposure, you are getting international exposure for a pretty significant portion of those earnings, but you're also getting great management. And then you can add all these other things like rule of law that are very important. And when you, if you like U.S. equities, are you worried at all about tech? Because they have been leading the rally and their valuations, some think, are the most overvalued of any. In our view, uh, this uh, concern about the tech sector and saying that this looks like the late 90s, 2000, is uh, a bit misplaced, this type of concern. Because when you actually look at the uh, relationship across sectors and you look at their valuations based on return on equity or other measures, all sectors seem to be about fairly valued. If you looked at 2000, information technology was substantially overvalued relative to other sectors in the equity market. For example, if you looked at the return on equity and what you paid for that, you were paying two and a half times more for the technology sector's return on equity relative to other sectors. So that was a big dislocation. You don't see that anymore. In fact, there have been a lot of articles and commentary about the impact of the FANGs, meaning sort of Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, or Netflix, depending on what people like to use, and Google. And if you take those out of the S&P, people will say S&P returns have been anemic. That is factually not correct. In fact, if you take the returns, let's say for 2017, about 22%, and you take out the fangs, you're left with about a 19% return. That means other sectors have done quite well. So even though technology has outperformed, broadly we don't think it is overvalued relative to other sectors in the market. And are your clients worried at all? Are they interested in cryptocurrencies? Are they interested in Bitcoin? Are they worried that it's gonna destroy the market? What are you hearing from clients and what's your point of view? Cryptocurrencies are the hot topic. Uh, one of our colleagues, Mary Rich, has actually spent a lot of time on it, and uh, she's so much in demand because everybody wants to talk to her and learn more about cryptocurrencies, learn about blockchain. Our view is that while we like the concept of blockchain and think it will evolve into a useful tool for companies, for the financial industry, we think cryptocurrencies in their current format, meaning in the, in the current incarnation, are in a bubble. We actually have a couple of very interesting exhibits in our report, and the report's available for any of your uh, viewers who would like to see it on the, uh, the Goldman Sachs website. And we show the returns of cryptocurrencies against other asset classes that have been in bubble territory. So for example, we compare it to the topics in 1990. We compare it to the NASDAQ in 2000. And what you can see is that basically uh, these other big bubbles that we've had look like a flat line, even compared to tulip bulb prices, tulip mania in the 1600s, which was a bubble we always talk about tulip mania, the Bitcoin prices are astronomical. Then we compare that to Ether, and Ether is even more astronomical. So clearly these valuations don't make sense to us. In addition, we think that these currencies have major shortcomings. Is there room for a digital currency maybe sponsored by one of the major uh, central banks like the Federal Reserve? Yes. Could it be incredibly useful? Could it reduce transaction costs? Yes. But not these ones. And how connected is it to the rest of the market? Could there be, if all of it blows up, will it impact you know, other people's portfolios? That's an excellent question, and clients ask us if the dot-com bubble burst or when subprime mortgages led to uh, the, the downdraft and the, eventually the global financial crisis, could we see something similar from the impact of cryptocurrencies coming down? But cryptocurrencies are, are a much smaller part of the global economy. You can look at whether you compare it to US GDP or global GDP. It's less than 1% of global GDP. And so in terms of the impact, it'll have some impact. There are a lot of people who have set up various uh, exchanges, infrastructure, hedge funds in that space. So obviously they will get hurt, but it's a very, very small part of global GDP.